Turn, if you will, to James chapter 4. Sandy and I had the privilege of being away in Florida um, last uh, week, and um, 85 sunny. It's called Suffering for Jesus, but somebody has to do it, so we decided we'd go. Um, if Emmanuel ever starts a south campus, it'd be nice down there in Florida. I'd at least volunteer for the winter months and uh, that, but uh, God is good. We got to read a lot of books, and that's People say, what do you do on vacation? We run around here all the time. We just go to the pool, and we sit, and we read. And it was nice. God even let us have the pool to ourselves for several days. It's like, wow, maybe we shouldn't shower anymore. Maybe people will just leave us by ourselves. It must have smelled us or something. But it was a, a great read, some biographies, and it challenges your faith. Um, one of them was uh, about a Muslim girl that um, came from Sri Lanka with her family to Ohio. Uh, she was 12. A friend invited her to her youth group at her church. She went to the youth group. She came to know Jesus. Um, her parents found out and were furious with her. Um, she ended up leaving the house, running away, ended up being taken to Ohio, uh, from Ohio to Florida just for her own protection. Her parents hunted her down in Florida. There was all kind of legal things, and she was put in a detention home until they were trying to decide. She turned 18 and then was free. She's written a book. She still has no relationship with her parents and um, any of her family, um, and she's actually in hiding, um, but it's a very powerful book. I read a book um, from the Voices of Martyrs, um, and it was about eight women in different countries that uh, paid the ultimate for following Jesus Christ. And I think of that song, and you're the great I am, and he's a great God, and we in America were spoiled. We have no idea what persecution's about. If somebody ridicules us, we're like, oh, I guess I'll just keep quiet about my faith. I don't want anybody to call me a holy ruler or fanatic. But these people literally put their lives on the line. One guy was in prison. Uh, one lady's husband, who's a pastor, was in prison for 14 years. Was in prison for eight years. Came out. And he was home maybe two years. They rearrested him um, over in Romania. And I'm like, wow, being away from your spouse and your children that long for Jesus. Wow, that, that takes a love for the Lord. Um, and uh, who knows what's coming to America someday. You know, Christians are starting to get persecuted and for our beliefs. Uh, if you're in James chapter 4, I want to read verses 13 to 17. James writes, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city. We'll spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag, and all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good that he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Father, thank you for today. Thank you that you are the great I am. You never change. You stay the same through the ages, and your love never fails. Lord, I pray that each one here has a personal relationship with you. But if there are those outside of Jesus today, I pray that they'd understand their need for Jesus as their Savior. They'd make that decision today. They'd become a member of your family. Thank you for those at the early service that prayed to give their lives to Christ. Lord, help us to not get bogged down in the past or so obsessed with the future that we miss the present. Help us to realize that you are trustworthy. Lord, bless the middle school with Dave. Bless the children's church and nursery as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The truth is that all too often, you and I aren't very adept at enjoying what's right in front of us. We wrestle, we struggle mightily with how to live in the moment, how to really and truly appreciate the present, how to relax and enjoy the good things in our lives. This very real struggle is not always, it's not usually a result of our current problems, even though we have current problems and they can play that role in our life. The simple truth is this, our fears and our anxieties are quite often the result of not knowing what tomorrow holds. Not knowing what tomorrow may bring. 
We, a lot of us tell ourselves, you know what, yes, right now life is decent. It's pretty good right now. But how do I know if it's, if it's going to continue this way? What's lurking around the corner? What's looming over the next hill, over the horizon? Maybe, just maybe, and we tell ourselves, because that's the way we are, quite probably, bad news is on its way. It's how a lot of people live their lives. And I just read for you from James, where James tells us that tomorrow is no guarantee. And so we allow ourselves to get unnerved and anxious. <coughs> this fear of the future makes it extremely difficult to remain content, satisfied with the present. And I know some of you say, well, Pastor, you tell me, what choice do we have? In a world and of uncertainty and constant change, can we ever afford to relax? Pastor, don't you think the responsible thing is that we just tense up, that we're always alert and we remain ready for action? Yes, listen, it is important to be responsible. But if you have not figured it out yet, you will at some point. You and I cannot control life. We cannot guarantee safety. We can't guarantee serenity. We can't guarantee success. Jesus offers us a better way to life than anxiety. He never promises us. You can search the Gospels, search all through the Scriptures, and you'll never see a promise that says we are guaranteed a life void of troubles or pain or suffering. Instead, Jesus gives us something better. He shows us how to trust in God every moment, moment by moment. And it's our trust in the Lord that we find real life. When I think of God's Word and verses that <clears throat> instruct us and encourage us to put our complete trust in God, I'm reminded of the book of Proverbs written by Solomon in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We read these words. Trust in the Lord. How? With all your heart. Trust in the Lord. Don't count on yourself. Don't rely on other people. Trust in the Lord. How? With all your heart. Not part of your heart, but all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Don't rely on yourself, how you view things, your perception. Instead, on all your ways, acknowledge Him. Acknowledge the Lord. Acknowledge God. And He will make your paths straight. Now, I have to confess to you, and if you're going to be honest, some of you got to make the same confession. I have this terrible and unhealthy habit of checking my cell phone way too often. I don't know what it is, but I can be sitting watching TV with Sandy during the evening, and I feel this pull, this tremendous urge to pull my cell phone out and look at it, thinking maybe, I tell myself, maybe someone sent me an important email. Maybe someone texted me and I have it on vibrate and I didn't hear it and it's a message I need. Or someone, I like to play, I used to play the, word, game, the game words and I don't play it anymore. Some of them were too smart for me, so I just eliminate them. But I think, well, maybe it's my turn to make a move, so I pull my cell phone out. And rightfully so, Sandy will be sitting right beside me and she'll look over and go, what are you doing? And she'll say, why don't you put your phone down and take a break? You need to relax and unwind and quit looking at your phone. And of course, she's right. And although I don't always say, honey, thank you for that reminder. You're exactly right. I'm going to put this phone down. Thanks for loving me that much and being concerned about me. That's not how I always respond. Sometimes the flesh is there. But I am a work in progress. And I've worked really hard to make sure that when we go out to eat that I refrain from any temptation to pull my phone out and get distracted from my beautiful wife. God's blessed me with a beautiful wife, and I'm glad for that. And I make a concerted effort not to play with my phone when we're out to eat. Now, I know I'm not alone because you see this crazy out-of-control phenomenon everywhere. You go out to a restaurant, and I remember walking in through the restaurant. They were seating us, and I see two people, and I go, that's cool, man. They're, they're bound to pray. And the closer I got, 
They're looking at their cell phone. I was going to stop at their table and go, you know what? I want to admire you. I want to applaud you for praying. And then I realized that they were playing on their phones. They weren't praying. I got one word, one letter misspelled, playing, praying, but they were playing. They weren't praying. But we see it two, three, four more people gathered together at a table, but they're totally disconnected from each other. Because each and every single one of them has their nose buried in some technological gadget, a cell phone or an iPad or something. And they're surrounded, get this, they are surrounded by living, breathing, real human beings that are capable of talking, but every one of them is engrossed with digital and personal gadgets. And then to make matters worse, Think about it. It's not like the image that we portray online is even that accurate or complete. A lot of us act as art directors of our lives via the social media. And I'll explain what I mean to you. I like to fish. And you can catch a small fish, and they tell me, just put the fish out away from you. Take the picture, and it looks like it's bigger. So we like to make people think we got this big fish, and it's probably about that big, and on the, it looks like that in the screen. Oh, look at this big fish I caught. You don't want to take it home because it's not near that size. And then there are people that go away and stay in places, and they want you to think they got this amazing view, so they do all kinds of twists out their balcony. Here, look, I'm by the sunset, and they're doing all these contortions that a gymnast would be proud of and making it look like a misleading impression that where you're staying is this incredible place that has an incredible view. But it's not always an accurate representation. I wonder... How many of the things that we stare at on social media, they've been staged, they've been cropped, they've been photoshopped. Oh, this beautiful view of the sunset, that's not real. Somebody made that up. There was a patriotic one going around, and then people going, that's not real. People made that picture up. They photoshopped it. We have this innate desire to be where we're not. The grass is always greener on the other side. That could be the mantra of the human race. While we were, while we're uh, relaxing and, and enjoying lounging in our luscious green thick grass, we wonder, does a person next to me, do they have more luscious green grass? Do they have bluegrass? Is bluegrass better than my green grass? Wait a minute, maybe they have pink grass. Maybe that'd be better than this green grass. All I have is this boring green grass. I'd much rather have something different. I want something more exciting. That's the principle that marketing operates on. Marketing's purpose is to convince us that for a small price, we can have it all. We can have something much better. How many times are you sitting there watching TV and here comes this commercial about the cruise lines or beaches. You can go to beaches or sandals. And they tell us for a small fortune, you can enjoy two weeks in some tropical paradise, some utopia. So we discipline ourselves. And we put up with the gray skies from November to March. And the frigid temperatures and the blowing and drifting snow in order to make our dreams come true. And what's the first thing we do when we get to this glamorous site? Got to get connected to the Wi-Fi. Think about it. They got Wi-Fi. Got to have Wi-Fi. Now, how, we got to see what's going on in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. <laughs> how pathetic is that? Talk about a shallow life. We can be in Hawaii. We can be in the Caribbean. We can be in Florida. We're wondering what's going on in Johnstown. Listen, I love Johnstown. But if I'm in Florida or the Caribbean or Hawaii, shouldn't I be enjoying that location? We often view time with that same grass is greener mentality. For example, the older we get, the more we find ourselves saying, wow, I long for the good old days. The good old days. How about you? You ever said that? I like the good old days when we were kids. We told ourselves, I'll never say what my parents said. Now we're saying that ourselves, and 
I like that when phones are either on the wall, rotary phones. Now people are going, rotary phones? Phones on the walls? Phones in jacks? What's that all about? And we say, oh, well, I liked it because we could just focus on the person we were with. Life was much better. Those were simpler times. But I can assure you of this. Those were equally stressful times. We couldn't get a hold of the people we wanted to. We said we needed to because they weren't near a phone. Or we didn't have access to a phone. Now, I know there were times in our lives where we would have loved to get a hold of someone because... We had an important message or we felt there was some emergency, some news event that we needed to inform others of. I remember being in the Dominican Republic four months after we were married on a mission trip. I can't believe I left Sandy after four months. I can't believe she, I can't believe she encouraged me to go. <laughs> she also encouraged me to come back. So I, but uh, I was thinking that was 35 years ago. There was no cell phone. No way of getting hold of her, no computer, no email to tell her I'm okay, you know, that I missed her, that I loved her. And the reality is human nature hasn't changed. It just manifests itself differently. The funny thing about memories is that they have a way of looking larger than life. We have this tendency to glamorize the past and we look at it through rose-colored glasses. What we do is we filter out the negative of our past and remind ourselves of only the positive. I hear people saying, I wish I could be a young person today. You know, they have it tough today. But listen, it was tough in our day going through the schools and all that peer pressure and things. Instead of the good old days, others become obsessed about someday. There's a single person that says, you know what? Currently, I am single. And quite frankly, I'm lonely and I'm disconnected, and I'm stressed out. Someday, I hope to get married, and then I'll be complete. God, please let that someday come quickly. And it comes around, and you get married, and it's fun, and you enjoy the intimacy. But soon after the honeymoon, you come to this stark realization, wait a minute, I got to go back, and I got a job. And I got a responsibilities. I have a schedule to keep. And you discover this. When you're married, you have another human being to coordinate with and to communicate with. And you know that you should be spending regular time at home. And then you see some of your friends that are still single, and you think, oh, the good old days when I was as free as a bird. And I didn't have to check with anyone before I planned something. What happened? Forgot how lonely you were. And how you so craved and desired a life partner. That's human nature. We're skilled at missing the good old days. And we're good at longing for someday. But in that process, we undervalue the importance of today. How many of us have gone through life saying, I can't wait till I get out of school? Can't wait till I get out of college. Can't wait till I get a job. Can't wait till I retire. We're always looking for some other day. And a lot of what happens is we undervalue the importance of today. A lot of our fulfillment and our contentment in life comes from the simple and the underrated ability to appreciate the present, to actually embrace and enjoy the moment. It's called carpe diem, seize the day. That's what I'm talking about. I have to be honest. There are times like, if I can just get through this, if I can just get through this, if I can just get through it, that's not how God wants us to live life. And what we're doing is missing out on the day that he's given us. In Psalm, I believe it's 118, 24. I like it because sometimes people go, oh, he believes it, so I'm going to check it now to catch the pastor. He gave us the wrong verse. People do that to me. I was just in a discussion with someone. They go, I go, what are you doing? Checking that verse. I go, problem was that person was my wife. <laughs> but Psalm 118, 24 says this, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. That's a great verse to start your day. Today, Lord, is a day you have made. It's the only day that I have guaranteed I'm going to rejoice and I'm going to be glad in it. We live life best when we live it out without regretting the past or fearing the future. 
Yes, we should definitely learn from the past. And yes, we should prepare for the future. I'm all about living wisely and carefully, but that certainly doesn't mean that we ignore today, the present. Life doesn't consist of what should have happened, what might have happened, or what hopefully will happen. Life is what's happening right now, today. The past affects and it informs the present. And the future helps us how to decide how to, uh, to decide how to live today. But the only moment that we can actually live in this is, is the present, the here and now. The question is this. In a world that's unstable and hands us more than our share of tragedy and evil, how do you and I remain stable in the present? The Word of God gives us the answer. Hebrews 13.8 is a great verse. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Didn't we sing that song, You Stay the Same Through the Ages? Your love never changes. And I I get weepy a lot of times when we're singing, and I think, wow, some people really get that. The people that are being persecuted across the world, they really get that, that God's love stays the same through the ages. It never changes. He's the one constant. And then I think some of us are just so detached from God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. That changes the way we view our lives. In a world of constant flux or change, Jesus never changes. Neither does God the Father. In Malachi 3.6, He says, I am the Lord, I do not change. We look at the Bible, we go, wow, those stories are great. It'd be great if God was like that today. Listen, God is still in the miracle working business today. He is still performing miracles. He is still changing lives. James 1.17 tells us, Every good gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. He is the same. Listen, I already told you that I'm a work in progress. We are all work in progress. We make mistakes. We fail. We learn. We change. We grow and we keep trying. But listen, God never fails. He never changes. He is perfect. He's awesome. He's wonderful. He's righteous. He's holy. He has always been, and He will always be. God's constancy stabilizes our lives. The fact that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever means we can trust Him in this moment and in every moment. Turn to the Gospel of John chapter 11. This good old day versus someday mentality was alive and well when Jesus walked the face of this earth, when He was in Palestine for 33 years. I want to begin by looking at John chapter 11. And I said at the uh, 8 o'clock service, I think so many times we are lazy in, in churches. We don't even want to bother looking for the verse. Maybe it's our pride. We don't know where it is. Don't let that stop you. Pick up a Bible in front of you. Look at the table of contents. If you're by somebody, help them, lovingly help them. But in the one book on the Book of Martyrs, they were talking about people in villages. They would give anything to have one Bible in print. And they learned the Scriptures and they treasured the Scriptures. And I told Sandy, you know what? Those people... Church and God was their life. They didn't have anything else. They didn't have all the distractions we have. So I hope that you follow along in John chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same woman who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. And so the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one that you love, he's sick. And in the original language, he's gravely ill. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Look at verse 6. Yet... When he heard that Lazarus was sick, he understood that Lazarus was extremely ill. 
he stayed where he was two more days. Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, were very dear friends of Jesus. All they had to say is, this one you love is sick. And he knew it was Lazarus. He had often been a guest in their home in Bethany. Lazarus becomes gravely ill. His sisters summon for Jesus, hoping that he would heal their precious brother. The first time we read this narrative, we are startled by Jesus' reaction. His very dear friend is gravely ill, but he does nothing. He chooses to remain where he is for two more days instead of hightailing it to Bethany. The situation deteriorates, and the Bible tells us that Lazarus dies. Let's pick up in verses 20 to, 40, uh, to 27. Because by the time Jesus finally goes to Bethany, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Verse 20, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, if you know anything about Martha, she's a person of activity. She's always serving and always busy. She runs out to meet Jesus, but Mary stayed at home. Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. He'd still be alive. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, yeah, Lord, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I, yeah, there's the day coming. Yeah, he'll rise again. Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who was to come into the world. You're the Messiah, the one we've been looking for. I believe that. Jesus shows up and Martha responds exactly as we might have responded. She looks at the past. She looks at what could have happened, what she is fully convinced in her mind should have happened, and what she expected to happen. Lord, if you would have just come when we summoned for you, my brother would still be alive. Look at Jesus' response, verse 20. You know what? Your brother will rise again. And at that, Martha jumps to the other end of the time spectrum. Yeah, Lord, I know that one day Lazarus will indeed rise again. She goes from looking into the past to the future. Yes, yeah, someday her brother's going to live again. Someday her dreams will come true. Someday things will get better. Don't you find yourself doing that sometimes? Someday this will happen. Someday it's going to get better. But she's avoiding the present. It's just too painful. It's too hard to believe that her circumstances can change right now. They could change in an instant. Now her faith for the future is admirable. But Jesus wants to under her to understand something very important. He's not just the God of the past. He's not just the God of the future. He is the God of the present, the God of today, the God of here and now. Jesus doesn't just sympathize with her pain. He wants to do at that very moment what Martha can't, what Martha won't allow herself to imagine. Now, let's be honest. You and I tend to do that exact same thing. We say, well, you know what? I just wish God would have done something different in my life. I wish this wouldn't have happened in my life. Or we say, I hope someday God will fix things. Someday in the future, He'll make things right. But often, here's the reality. God wants to do something amazing. He wants to do something miraculous, awesome. He wants to do it today. He wants to do an amazing thing. He is the God of our current circumstances. Listen. He knows exactly what we're facing. And guess what? He knew we'd be facing it long before it happened. So we can embrace this day and trust God in every single moment. Some of us tell us, you know, someday in heaven, I'm finally going to be happy. But right now, my circumstances are clearly not conducive to any miracle. Right now, 
my life is basically a mess. And I guess I'll just have to suck it up and deal with it until I get to heaven. Or we believe as Christians that heaven's real and that one day God's going to make everything right. We know that faith sometimes means hang in there. But just because someday the Bible tells us that God will destroy death, that's the last enemy to be destroyed according to 1 Corinthians 15, 26. And God's going to destroy death and sin and pain. He's going to do that in the future. That doesn't mean that life has to stink right now. That's where some of us are. How you doing? Okay, under the circumstances. Well, what are you doing under the circumstances? What about God? He's the God of today. I love John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I want to zero in on the phrase, I am. Now turn to John 8, because that's not the first time in the gospel of John that Jesus said, I am. In John 8, Jesus is having this discussion with the religious leaders of his day. And naturally, Jesus is winning the discussion. Now look at verse 56 of John 8. Your father Abraham, he rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. Abraham saw my day, and he was glad. Now, look at verse 57. The religious leaders say, wait, whoa, stop right there. Wait, we know who you are. You're Jesus, born of Joseph and Mary. You're from Nazareth. We know you're not even 50 years old. And listen, man, you're trying to tell us that you have seen Abraham. Jesus said, verse 58, before Abraham was, what? A couple of you read it. Before Abraham was, what? I am. Now, at this point of the narrative, the English majors who specialize in grammar are saying, whoa, whoa, stop there. Wait a minute. How about a grammar timeout? Jesus, you, you're speaking. You've got it wrong. You have your tenses mixed up. I think you made to say before Abram was, I was. No. Jesus meant exactly what he said. We say, well, was and am don't belong together. They're two different tenses. You either are or you were. Jesus, what are you talking about here when you say before, before Abram was, I am? Keep in mind that God's infallible. And so is His eternal Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Rest assured, Jesus knew exactly what He was saying when He said before Abram was, I am. He's making a point that He didn't want the religious leaders to miss. He was communicating that He is timeless. Here's the fact. God simply is. He's in the present. He's in the past. He's in the future. He will always exist in the present tense because God is outside of time and space. Whenever you look on the timeline of human history, God is always present and active. He's not just a memory from the past. He's not just a promise for the future. He is a real-time, present-day God. Jesus, when he said, I am, was actually quoting from the book of uh, Exodus, the second book in your Bible, Exodus chapter 3. In chapter 2, we read about Moses being rescued from uh, the, the murderous plot to kill all the Hebrew uh, Israelite baby boys. His mom puts him in an ark and puts him in the river. And he's floating in the river, and the princess finds him in the river, takes him back to the palace, raises him in Egyptian royalty, finest education. One day Moses grows up and he sees a fellow Israelite being beaten. They were slaves, the Israelites were, to the Egyptians. He sees one of his fellow Jews being beaten and he kills the taskmaster. He thought no one saw it, but he finds out, no, somebody discovered him. He said, well, you know what, I'm in trouble now. I killed an Egyptian. They're going to want me. So he takes off and he runs to the wilderness. And he's in that wilderness for the next 40 years. Here he is in the wilderness, the desert, a man hated by the Egyptians and mistrusted by the Jews. Listen, he certainly wasn't a prime candidate to deliver his people from slavery. But one particular day, Moses was tending to his father-in-law's sheep 
in the backside of that desert when he notices a rather strange sight. There is a bush burning that is not consumed by fire. It just keeps on burning, but the fire never goes out. And so he goes closer to investigate this odd happening. And in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, God says to Moses, he calls out Moses, Moses, Moses responds, verse 4, here I am. Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals because the ground you're standing on is holy. And then he says, Moses, I have an assignment for you. I want you to go back to Egypt from where you fled and I want you to go back and tell the Pharaoh, you are to let the Israelites go. Now, Moses was less than thrilled with that. He hit the panic button. He's a wanted man. There's no way that Pharaoh would willingly concede to releasing his workforce of Israelites. Someone had to build the pyramids. Someone had to build the tombs and other buildings. And Moses is like, whoa, God, wait just a minute. You got the wrong person. Who am I to tackle such a task? Lord, I don't even speak well. So obviously, you have the wrong man for such a monumental task. And then he caps off his argument by asking the question in verse 13, when uh, if, suppose I go back, God, and I tell the Israelites I'm supposed to be your leader, and they say, well, wait, wait a minute, what's the name of this God? What am I supposed to tell them that your name is? Look at verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to Israel. I am has sent me to you. <clears throat> that was all Moses needed to know. In the midst of Moses' insecurity and his identity crisis, God doesn't try to build up Moses. Read it. He doesn't say, come on, Moses, look, look at you. Look, Moses, you're an obvious candidate. You're a great man. You're obviously special elite. You got the best education that money could buy, and you are a brilliant man. No. To set my, Moses' mind at ease, God reminds Moses of who he, God, is. The answer to our identity crisis is not to first and foremost focus on ourselves, but rather instead to focus on Almighty God. God was saying this, I love it. Moses, I got you covered. I got your back. I'm here for you. I have all the supply surplus you could ever possibly want or need. Listen, Moses, I am. I am the self-existent one. I have no beginning and no end. I am eternal. Wow. That changes everything. When Jesus uses that same word, I am, in the original language to Martha, he's saying to Martha, Martha, I'm the resurrection and life. He's reminding her, Martha, I am all that you really need. You don't need anything else. In her grief and desperation, Jesus is the answer. His I am is more than enough for her I need. You need? You need today? Jesus says, I am. I am sufficient to meet your needs. I am all that you need. After Jesus converses with Martha in John 11, her sister Mary comes out to Jesus, and she basically says the same, look, if you'd have been here, this wouldn't, we wouldn't be in this condition. Jesus sees these sisters weeping, and he's moved with compassion when he sees her unimaginable pain and heartache and misery. Verse 35 is one of the most beautiful verses in all Scripture. John eleven thirty-five 35 says, Jesus wept. Look, you can go home today and say, I learned a verse in church today. Jesus wept. John eleven thirty-five. Rest assured, according to that verse and other verses in Scripture, Jesus feels our pain. You don't have to wonder, does he feel my pain? Say, feel my pain. He feels your pain. He knows what he's going to do to fix our situation, but he still weeps with us. He mourns with us. He suffers with us. Then Jesus goes on and he gives a command for someone to roll the stone away from Lazarus' grave, verse 39. But Martha quickly protests saying, Lord, no way. Listen, don't you get it? My brother's been dead four days and by now he smells. And opening that grave is just going to let that stench of death out to fill the air. 
Jesus says, no, roll the stone away. Are you serious, Lord? Yes, I am. Move that stone. Up until the last minute, Martha was having real trouble believing that what she desperately wanted to happen was about to happen. She seems to be unnerved, frightened. She's afraid to hope. She's afraid to trust. She's afraid to believe. Here's the best part. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead in spite of those fears. You and I have a habit of allowing our own fears to short circuit what God wants to do. But the good news is this. God can do what He wants when He wants to do it. He is sovereign. He doesn't even need our faith, our spirituality, our good works, or our permission to do what He intends to do. He is God. He's sovereign. He operates by grace. Sometimes you and I are so acutely, keenly aware of our own limitations that we unknowingly and we wrongfully project those same limitations onto God. I don't see any answer for it. I I don't have the resources. God must not have the resources either. Listen, God's not limited by anything, including our own insufficiencies. Remember, we sang, you are the great I am. He is all we need. He's all we could ever want. And then some. He can do these things before we think we're ready for them. He's an amazing God. He blesses us even when we don't deserve to be blessed. And our weaknesses, as glaring as they are, as apparent as they are to us, don't slow Him down one bit. Instead, they serve to demonstrate what a faithful God He is. What a powerful God is. What a good God he is. God is that amazing. He's that great. We sing we, we, the little children's prayer, God is good, great is, God is great. That's so true. God, you are good. You are great. And we're going to spend the rest of our lives being continually overwhelmed by his greatness, by his grace. That's why I weep a lot of times. And I think of people in the church and what God's doing in their lives. I go, wow, there's testimony that God is good. So what circumstances are you facing today that need the life, the touch of God? What's going on in your world today that, wow, I need God to show up, and I need God to show up big time? What dreams and hopes have you had that have been buried? They died, and they've been buried. Listen, Jesus wants to roll the stone away. When Lazarus came out, he said, unloose him. Take his death clothes off of him. Set him free. Listen, Jesus wants to take the death clothes off of you and set you free so that you can live life. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set set you free. Jesus is that truth. Jesus wants to roll the stone away. For Lazarus, Jesus was the source of resurrection and life. For Moses, God was a source of security and deliverance. God is your source, He's your sufficiency, He's your salvation. Maybe you've concluded, well, before God can work, I need to get all my ducks in a row. I need to get taken care of some business in my life. I need to fix all my faults and solve all my failures and my weaknesses. Let me remind you as we close that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is able to save you all by Himself. He can help you, especially if you don't even deserve it, if you don't earn it, if you don't predict His help, if you don't prepare for His help, even if you don't believe that He can do it, He is a today God. He's a now God. And the good news is this. He is here for you. Let us pray. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I want to ask you, can you say, I know Jesus personally. I know Him as my Savior. If you can say that, thank God for that assurance. You are a child of God. But maybe, like some in the other service, there's some here today say, wow, I don't have that personal relationship you're talking about. I know a little bit about Jesus, but I don't know him personally. If you'd like to know Jesus, if you'd like to put your faith in him for salvation, the good news is he says, the one that comes to me, I'll never turn away. Maybe you sense him knocking at your heart's door today. You can pray a prayer similar to this in the quietness of your own heart, inviting Jesus to be your Savior. Dear Lord Jesus, today, Lord, I'm going to admit, I'm going to agree that I am a sinner. 
And I'm in need of a Savior. And I understand that you're that Savior. You came to this earth and you shed your blood and gave your life to pay for my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. Would you please forgive me and cleanse me? Jesus, I'm opening my heart's door and I'm inviting you in to be my Savior. And I want to follow you from this moment on. Thank you for saving me. So heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you prayed that prayer today, just ask that you slip your hand. I'm not going to point you out in any fashion whatsoever. You say, Pastor, I prayed. Yes, are there any others that say, I prayed? Yes. You may put your hands on. Any others? Yes. Perhaps there are those who say, I want to commit to trusting God to work in my life moment by moment. I find myself getting bogged down in the past, yearning for the good old days, or just trying to get through today for tomorrow. And I understand that tomorrow is not a guarantee. I want to trust God for the day to day, moment by moment in my life. Would you pray for me? Are there any like that? Father, I thank you for your love for each one of us. I thank you for those that have said yes to Jesus today. There's joy in heaven and there's joy in my heart because of those that have entered your family. Lord, I thank you for those that have said, I'm tired of living for the good old days or just trying to get through today. Lord, help us to practice carpe diem, to seize today. Thank you that you are the God of the present, that you want to do a great work in and through our lives. Lord, I thank you for this body of believers. I thank you for your grace, your mercy, your patience toward each one of us. Lord, I pray that this week we practice your presence. We enjoy, we cherish, we relish each and every day that you give to us. Because tomorrow is not a guarantee. Help us to live life with no regrets. Thank you for you being the great I am. Lord, I ask you to dismiss us with your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.